For the current active service branch, see United States Air Force The Aeronautical Division, Signal Corps was the first heavier-than-air military aviation organization in history and the progenitor of the United States Air Force. A component of the U.S. Army Signal Corps, the Aeronautical Division procured the first powered military aircraft in 1909, created schools to train its aviators, and initiated a rating system for pilot qualifications. It organized and deployed the first permanent American aviation unit, the 1st Aero Squadron, in 1913. The Aeronautical Division trained 51 officers and two enlisted men as pilots, and incurred 13 fatalities in air crashes. During this period, the Aeronautical Division had 29 factory-built aircraft in its inventory, built a 30th from spare parts, and leased a civilian airplane for a short period in 1911, following statutory authorization of an aviation section in the Signal Corps by the United States Congress in 1914. The Aeronautical Division continued as the primary organizational component of the section until April 1918, when its inefficiency in mobilizing for World War I caused the War Department to replace it with an organization independent of the Signal Corps that eventually became the foundation of the Army's Air Service. <laughs> Birth of an air arm The United States Army Signal Corps became associated with aeronautics during the American Civil War, when Thaddeus S. C. Lowe was named Chief of the Union Army Balloon Corps. In 1892, Major General Adolphus Greeley, Chief Signal Officer of the Army, formulated plans for a war balloon detachment for the Signal Corps and authorized the purchase of a balloon from France, dubbed the General Maya, based at Fort Riley in 1893 and Fort Logan in 1894. When the General Maya deteriorated, a second balloon, the Santiago, was manufactured by members of the Signal Corps in 1897 using the General Maya as a model, and served in combat in Cuba in 1898. In 1898–99, the War Department accepted the report of an aeronautically-minded investigating committee that included Alexander Graham Bell and invested $50,000 for the rights to a heavier-than-air flying machine machine being developed by Samuel Pierpont Langley, secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. Although Langley's aerodrome failed embarrassingly, the Army later resumed its interest in aviation as a result of the success of the Wright brothers and entered into protracted negotiations for an airplane. All balloon school activities of the U.S. Army Signal Corps were transferred to Fort Omaha, Nebraska, in 1905. In 1906, the Commandant of the Signal School in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, Major George O. Squire, studied aeronautical theory and lectured on the Wright Flying Machine. One of his instructors—Captain Billy Mitchell—was also a student of aviation and taught the use of reconnaissance balloons. Squire became executive officer to the chief signal officer, Brigadier General James Allen, in July 1907, and immediately convinced Allen to create an aviation entity within the Signal Corps, the Aeronautical Division, Signal Corps, consisting at its inception of one officer and two enlisted men, began operation on August 1, 1907. Captain Charles DeForest Chandler was named to head the new division, with Corporal Edward Ward and Private First Class Joseph E. Barrett as his assistants. First Lieutenant Frank P. Lom, a cavalry officer, was also detailed to the division and joined it September 17, 1907. Both Chandler and Lom were balloonists. Lom had earned renown the year before when he won the inaugural Gordon Bennett Cup, an international balloon event, while Chandler was already a member of the Aero Club of America. He remained head of the division until 1908, then again from 1911 to 1913. 
During the interim, he was relieved by Lom and from May 1910 to June 1911, while Chandler attended the Signal School course at Fort Leavenworth by Capt. Arthur S. Cowan, a former infantry officer and non-aviator assigned to the Signal School. On December 23, 1907, the Signal Corps issued specification number 486 for a heavier-than-air flying machine and requested bids. A copy of the specification was sent to the Wrights on January 3, 1908. The following April 30 LOM and 1st Lieutenant Thomas E. Selfridge reported to New York City along with civilian balloonist Leo Stevens to familiarize 25 members of the 1st Company, Signal Corps, a unit of the 71st New York Infantry, in the use of hydrogen-filled kite balloons. The company was organized to provide the New York National Guard with an aeronautical corps for balloon observation, commanded by Major Oscar Orlandine. Topic: Acquisition of aircraft. In 1908, the Aeronautical Division, at the intercession of President Theodore Roosevelt in the acquisition process, purchased a non-rigid dirigible from Thomas Scott Baldwin for US$6,750, equivalent to US$188,225 in 2018, and an airplane from the Wright Brothers for US$25,000, equivalent to US$697,100. $30 in 2018. Specification number 486 required both types of aircraft be able to carry two persons. The dirigible had to be able to carry a load of 450 pounds, 200 kilograms, and reach a speed of 20 miles per hour, 32 kilometers per hour. The airplane's requirements were a load of 350 pounds, 160 kilograms, a speed of 40 miles per hour, 64 kilometers per hour, and a flying distance of at least 125 miles, 201 kilometers. The dirigible was delivered first in July. 1908, after Baldwin submitted an extremely low bid to ensure receiving the contract. Baldwin and Glenn Curtis flew the test trials over Fort Maya and met all specifications except speed, which was just under the requirement. It was designated Signal Corps Dirigible No. 1. During August, Baldwin trained three officer candidates to fly the dirigible, Lom, Selfridge, and 1st Lieutenant Benjamin Fulwa, infantry. Fulwa was trained as the first dirigible pilot and prepared to move the ship from Fort Omaha to St. Joseph, Missouri, for a state fair exhibition. However, the first solo ascent in the dirigible, and the first flight solely by Army pilots, did not occur until May 26, 1909. The Wright brothers, who had been asking US$100,000 equivalent to $2,788,519 in 2018 for their airplane, then agreed to sell a Wright Model A satisfying the requirements for $25,000. They also received a US$5,000 equivalent to US$139,426 in 2018 bonus for exceeding the speed requirement. The airplane was delivered to Fort Maya, Virginia, on September 1, 1908, for trials. The first acceptance flight of the airplane was made on September 3 at Fort Maya, with Orville at the controls. Selfridge and Lom were named official observers of the trials of the Wright aeroplane for September 1908. Both Lom and Squire made acceptance flights as observers, and on September 13, Wright kept the airplane aloft for an hour and ten minutes. On the afternoon of September 17, 1908, two officers of the United States Navy, Lt. George C. Sweet and Naval Constructor, Lt. William McEntee, and another from the Marine Corps, 2nd Lt. Richard B. Creasy, were present at Fort Maya as official observers, accompanied by Secretary of the Navy Victor H. Metcalf. 
Under orders to travel to St. Joseph for the dirigible exhibition, Selfridge asked to take Sweet's place on a scheduled test flight, conducted in front of 2,500 onlookers. During the flight, flying at 150 feet 46 meters, a propeller split and shattered on the fourth lap, severing a guy wire to the rudder, and caused the airplane to crash. Wright was hospitalized, and Selfridge—the Army's only officer experienced in heavier-than-air flight—was killed in the first fatal crash of an airplane. Orville Wright, along with Wilbur this time, returned to Fort Maya in June 1909 with a new though smaller and faster airplane, powered by the engine from the wrecked 1908 flyer. The brothers spent the better part of July fine-tuning the airplane and warming up for the final tests while bad flying weather hampered much of the month. For 1909's acceptance trials both Lom and Fulwa were named as official observers. Lom flew with Wright on July 27, and on July 30, with President William H. Taft as a spectator, Fulwa and Wright in the final acceptance trial made a cross-country flight of 10 miles 16 kilometers around Shooters, or Shooters Hill between Fort Maya and Alexandria, Virginia. This flight broke all of the existing records for speed, duration with a passenger, and altitude with a passenger. Pleased with the performance of this airplane the Army purchased it awarding the rights States dollars equivalent to $697,130 in 2018 plus an added bonus of States dollars equivalent to $139,426 in 2018 $1,000 for each mile achieved over 40 miles per hour, 64 km per hour. Hour. The plane's best speed had been 45 miles per hour, 72 kilometers per hour, bringing the total sale price to 30,000 United States dollars, equivalent to $836,556 in 2018. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Airplane Operations. Topic. First solo flights The Army accepted the Wright A military flyer on August 2, 1909, designating it, "...Signal Corps SC No. 1." On August 25, the Army leased 160 acres .65 square kilometers of land along the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad at College Park, Maryland, for use as a training field. The newly purchased airplane was delivered to College Park on October 7, assembled by Wilbur Wright, and flown for the first time the next day. Wright began instruction of LAM and 2nd LT Frederick E. Humphreys, detailed from the Corps of Engineers, flying constantly in front of often large crowds of curiosity seekers, newspaper reporters, and dignitaries. Both soloed on October 26, Humphreys going ahead of LAM, the detachment commander, because it was his turn to fly. Although both flights were of less than 15 minutes in duration and 30 feet (9.1 meters) of altitude, late in the day, Lom remained aloft for 40 minutes, telling Wright he landed only because it was supper time. The Army's contract with the Wright brothers ended with the completion of training of the two student pilots, and Wilbur Wright made his last public flight on November 2. Later that day, Lom took Lieutenant. Sweet up as a passenger and he became the first naval officer to fly. On November 5, both pilots were aboard the airplane, with Lom at the controls, when it crashed in a low altitude turn. Although neither pilot was injured, and the Wrights bore the expense of repairs, the crash ended flights until 1910. Both Lom and Humphreys returned to duty with their respective branches. Topic. Fulwa and Beck The dirigible service proved short-lived, as the corrosive effects of weather and the hydrogen gas used to lift the ship caused the gasbag to leak with increasing severity. 
The dirigible was condemned and sold at auction. Fulwa had been a vocal critic of the dirigible, recommending that it be abandoned, and although one of the two candidates selected to be trained as an airplane pilot, he was sent to Nancy, France instead as a delegate to the International Congress of Aeronautics. Fulwa arrived back from France on October 23 and was given some preliminary flight time with Wilbur Wright, even though Wright was not contractually obligated to do so, with the intent that Humphreys would complete Fowloy's training. In November 1909, Fulwa became the only officer detailed to the aeronautical division. He accrued three hours and two minutes total flying time at College Park but did not solo. Because of inclement winter weather at College Park, Fulwa was assigned to move the flying program to Fort Sam Houston, an Army post near San Antonio, Texas. Fulwa and eight enlisted men disassembled the still damaged SC. No. 1, shipped it to Texas in 17 crates, and reassembled it on February 23, 1910, after building a shed to house it on the Arthur MacArthur Field used for cavalry drill. On 2 March 1910, after training himself, Fulwa logged his first solo from 9.30 am to 9.37 am and four flights in total, crashing the SC. No. 1 on its final landing. He achieved a maximum altitude of 200 feet 61 meters and a speed of 50 miles per hour 80 kilometers per hour in logging 59 minutes and 30 seconds of flight time. He flew the repaired craft five times on March 12, and received written instruction by mail from the Wright brothers. Until 1911, Fulwa remained as the Army's sole aviator and innovator. He stated in annotating the aircraft's flight log that he installed a 4 feet meters leather cinch strap from the cavalry saddlery as a safety belt on the SC. Number 1 on March 12, 1910, then on August 8 he and Oliver Simmons bolted wheels from a cultivator onto the landing skids to provide the first landing gear. SC No. 1 made its last flight, and the 66th on it by Fulwa, on February 8, 1911. In early 1911, the United States gathered much of the regular army in South Texas as a show of force to Mexican revolutionaries, forming the Maneuver Division. In March 1911, near Fort McIntosh at Laredo, Texas, Fulwa and Wright instructor Philip Oren Parmelee demonstrated the use of airplanes in support of ground maneuvers for the first time. The SC No. 1 was not sufficiently airworthy for the reconnaissance and messaging missions it performed, and for a nominal fee of $1, Fulwa rented the Wright B Flyer privately owned by Robert J. Collier, owner of Collier's Weekly, on February 21. Fulwa and Parmalee landed the rented airplane in the Rio Grande during their second flight. On March 5, Squire, now Chief Signal Officer of the Maneuver Division, formed a provisional aero company on April 5, 1911, the first aviation unit in American history, in anticipation of training 18 additional pilots. Five new airplanes were authorized for purchase, and two were received at Fort Sam on April 20, a Curtis 1911 Type 4 military aeroplane, Curtis Model D, designated Signal Corps No. 2, and a new Wright Model B that became SC. No. 3. Both came equipped with wheels rather than skids, and the Curtis aircraft was powered by an eight-cylinder, 60-horsepower engine in sharp contrast to the 40-horsepower four-cylinder training engines the student pilots were accustomed to. Two civilian pilots, Frank Trenholm Coffin of the Wright Company and Eugene Ely from Curtis, arrived with the aircraft to assist in instruction. All three of the Army's aircraft took to the air at the same time on April 22, 1911, during a parade and review of troops of the Maneuver Division at Fort Sam Houston, captured in a panoramic photograph linked below. After Army acceptance of the aircraft on April 27, Fulwa and Ely then undertook training a small group pilot candidates on the Curtis machine, including three capped. Paul W. Beck, 2nd Lieutenant George E. M. 
Kelly, and 2nd Lieutenant John C. Walker, Jr., who had been partially trained as prospective Curtis instructors by Glenn Curtis at North Island, San Diego, California, before being ordered to Texas. Student pilots were divided into separate sections because the flight controls on the two types were markedly different and the single-seat Curtis machines did not allow for dual instruction. SC No. 1, judged no longer airworthy due to many rebuilds, was retired from service on May 4 and sent to the Smithsonian Institution in October. The most proficient new pilot was Beck, who by seniority was made commander of the Provisional Aero Company, causing a permanent rift between himself and Fulwa, by far the more experienced pilot. The Curtis machine, SC. Number 2, nearly crashed on May 2 with Walker at the controls, nose diving when Walker attempted a turn. The plane cartwheeled and although Walker miraculously regained control, he was so badly shaken that he voluntarily withdrew from flying. The next day Beck crash landed SC. Number 2 when its engine failed while he was at 300 feet, 91 meters, severely damaging it. On May 10, Kelly, the least experienced pilot, was killed flying the same airplane on his qualification flight when he crashed while landing in gusty wind conditions. The division commander, Major General William H. Carter, immediately withdrew permission to fly at Fort Sam. Fulwa, who was a Mustang officer and a combat veteran of the Spanish-American War, blamed the crash on improper repairs to the Curtis D, and indirectly, on Beck. Fulwa also refused to serve under Beck, who took over as instructor and moved the school back to College Park with SC No. 3 in June. Fulwa remained behind with the Maneuver Division and was removed from aviation in July by assignment to the Militia Bureau in Washington, D.C. Beck served as the Curtis instructor at College Park until May 1, 1912, when he was returned to the infantry by enforcement of the so-called Manchu Law. Topic. Arnold and Milling While stationed in the Philippines in 1908, Second Lieutenant Henry H. Arnold assisted Capt. Arthur S. Cowan, then in the infantry, in a military mapping detail. Cowan returned to the United States, transferred to the Signal Corps, and was assigned to recruit two lieutenants to become pilots. Cowan contacted Arnold, who cabled his interest in also transferring to the Signal Corps but heard nothing in reply for two years. In 1911, relocated to Fort J., New York, Arnold sent a request to transfer to the Signal Corps, and on April 21, 1911, received orders detailing him and 2nd Lieutenant Thomas D. Milling to Dayton, Ohio, for flight instruction at the Wright Brothers Aviation School. Beginning instruction on May 3, Milling had soloed on May 8 after two hours of flight time while Arnold made his first solo flight May 13 after three hours and 48 minutes of flying lessons. In June, he and Milling completed their instruction and were sent to College Park, Maryland, as the Army's first flight instructors, on June 14. Two Wright B airplanes were available for use in instruction when SC. No. 4 was delivered five days later and joined SC. No. 3, newly arrived from Texas. The school officially opened on July 3, 1911, and taught ten students, including two members of the National Guard and Chandler, who had been assigned to command the school and division again after graduation from the Signal School. SC No. 2, repaired and returned to service, was joined at the end of July by SC No. 6, a new Curtis E. Scout, and Milling became the only aviator able to master the significantly different flight controls of each type. A split developed between the Wright pilots and the Curtis pilots 
That was not resolved until the Wright machines were phased out in 1914 for safety reasons. Milling won the tri state biplane race in a Wright B against a field of experienced flyers, flying a course from Boston, Massachusetts, to Nashua, New Hampshire, to Worcester, Massachusetts, to Providence, Rhode Island, and back to Boston, a total of 175 miles, without the use of a compass. It was also his first night flight, with several large bonfires providing guidance to the landing field. Arnold set an altitude record of 3,260 feet 990 meters on July 7, 1911, and twice broke it. In August, he experienced his first crash, trying to take off from a farm field after getting lost. At the end of the November the school disassembled its four aircraft and moved to Augusta, Georgia, for the winter, flying from a leased farm. One of its students, Lt. Col. Charles B. Winder of Ohio, was the first National Guard officer to complete flying training and receive an FAI certificate in the spring of 1912. Arnold accepted delivery of the Army's first tractor plane with a propeller and engine mounted on the front on June 26, 1912, but crashed into the bay at Plymouth, Massachusetts, during takeoff. Arnold began to develop a phobia about flying, intensified by the fatal crashes of the Wright Company instructor who taught him, Arthur L. Welsh on June 12, and an academy classmate of Arnold's, 2D Lt. Lewis Rockwell, on September 18, 1912, both in the new Wright C. Speed Scouts. In October 1912, Arnold and Milling were sent to Fort Riley, Kansas, to experiment with spotting for the field artillery. On November 5, Arnold's right C stalled, went into a spin, and he narrowly avoided a fatal crash. He immediately and voluntarily grounded himself, then returned to the infantry in 1913 after closing down the school at College Park, which was discontinued in favor of one with favorable flying conditions year round on North Island at San Diego, California, later named Rockwell Field in 1917 in memory of Arnold's classmate. Appropriations, growth, and incipient mutiny In 1911, the Aeronautical Division received its first direct appropriation from Congress for Aviation $125,000 for fiscal year 1912, half of what was proposed, and added five airplanes to its inventory. In addition to SCs 2, 3, 4, and 6, a Wright B was ordered to be built under license by Burgess Company and Curtis as its Model F. SC. Number 5, a sixth aircraft, a Wright B flyer designated SC. Number 7, was assembled at Fort McKinley in the Philippines and used by LOM to make the first flight of an American military airplane outside the continental United States on March 21, 1912. Rules of the Fédération Aéronautique Internationale FAI, were adopted, including standards for the certification of pilots, and Arnold and Milling became the first two Army pilots to be FAI certified. On February 23, 1912, the U.S. Army established its own military aviator rating and issued the first five of 24 to Arnold, Chandler, Milling, Beck, and Fulwa in July 1912. In February 1912, recognizing a need for specialized aircraft in field service, the Aeronautical Division drew up its first new specifications for aircraft since 1907, creating a «scout» classification for a two-man, slow-speed, tactical reconnaissance airplane, and «speed scout» for a lighter, faster, one-man airplane for strategic longer -ranged reconnaissance. In May 1912, the division purchased its first Speed Scout, a Wright C. The aircraft crashed during its acceptance trials on June 11 at College Park, killing 2nd Lieutenant Leighton W. Hazelhurst, who had been among the first class of student pilots, and Arthur L. Welsh, the Wright Company instructor who had taught Arnold to fly. Arnold himself was flying a Wright C. SC. 
No. 10 in November 1912 at Fort Riley, Kansas, when he was nearly killed. In total the division purchased six Wright C's not including the one flown by Welsh and Hazelhurst and a Burgess Model J a Wright C made under license, six of which crashed. This led to the grounding on February 24, 1914, of all «pusher» aircraft, including the sole Wright C survivor and a Burgess model rebuilt to Wright C standard. In anticipation of a possible war with Mexico, Chandler, four pilots, 21 enlisted men and a detachment of Curtis JN-3 airplanes were sent from the Aviation School's winter location at Augusta, Georgia, to Texas City, Texas, on February 28, 1913. Ultimately, eight pilots and nine airplanes trained with the 2nd Division on the Gulf Coast and San Antonio. Organized as a provisional unit on March 5, the 1st Aero Squadron became the first permanent unit of the Air Force on December 8, 1913. While at Texas City, the junior pilots complained directly about safety concerns to new Chief Signal Officer Brig. General George P. Scriven, who had come to Texas on an inspection trip after reading adverse newspaper reports on the squadron, in effect delivering an ultimatum to Scriven that either Chandler be replaced or they would withdraw from aviation. Despite calling the incident an incipient mutiny, Scriven relieved Chandler on April 1 and transferred him to Fort McKinley in the Philippines, replaced on an interim basis by Cowan, who was already in Texas City as the signal officer of the mobilizing 2D division. In September, Lt. Col. Samuel Reber, a former balloonist and influential member of the Aero Club of America, became the new head of the aeronautical division. Both Cowan and Reber were non-aviators, causing further friction with the pilots and creating a permanent consensus among them that only an aviator was qualified to command flying units. When the 1st Aero Squadron joined the Curtis Airplanes at North Island in June, Reber made Cowan Commandant of the Aviation School at North Island, deepening the divisions. The United States landed Marines and armed Bluejackets in the Mexican city of Veracruz on April 21, 1914. By April 24 they had completely occupied the city after severe fighting and were provided reconnaissance support by five Navy seaplanes assigned to the United States Atlantic Fleet. Two days later, to reinforce the Navy's aviation detachment, Fulwa and four pilots of the 1st Aero Squadron, soon designated the squadron's first company, crated their three Burgess H tractors and shipped them by rail to Fort Crockett at Galveston, leaving only two aircraft and five pilots in San Diego. First Company was itself reinforced by six new pilots but never uncrated their airplanes and left Texas on July 13, 1914. Topic. Expansion of the aviation service Beck was possibly the first advocate of an air service separate from the Army ground forces. In 1912 Beck authored an article for the Infantry Journal entitled, "'Military Aviation in America, Its Needs'", promoting the concept of an independent air force with its own missions. After he returned to the infantry, he continued to lobby friends in Congress to return to aviation. In February 1913, Representative James Hay Democrat Virginia introduced a bill intended to transfer aviation from the Signal Corps to the line of the Army as a semi-autonomous Air Corps. The bill was considered too radical and died in committee, but when the 1913 Appropriations Bill included many of its provisions, Hay offered a revised bill in May, H.R. 5304 an act to increase the efficiency in the aviation service." Hearings were held on the new bill in August 1913. Beck appeared to testify on behalf of the bill, the only officer to do so, and was opposed by Major Billy Mitchell, representing the General Staff, and Fulwa, Arnold, and Milling representing the Signal Corps. 
That bill had its original language expunged and was written to become the enabling legislation for the aviation section. Signal Corps on the 18th of July 1914, appropriations for aviation fell to $100,000, in part because the Signal Corps had spent only $40,000 of the fiscal year 1912 funding. However, as a result of the high number of fatalities, flight pay (35% increase above base pay) and accelerated promotion for pilots were approved by Congress on March 3, 1913. In the appropriations legislation, and the aeronautical division grew from 14 to 18 pilots. The Army Air Forces Statistical Digest World War II listed the strength of the division at 51 officers and men on November 1, 1912, and 114 on September 30, 1913. Statistics compiled for the H.R. 5304 hearings showed that United States ranked 14th in expenditures among the nations with air services. In the following year, Congress increased the size and prestige of Signal Corps aviation when it established the aviation section, with the Aeronautical Division continued as its headquarters component issuing orders in the name of the Chief Signal Officer. Reber became chief of the section and was promoted to lieutenant colonel, delegating the duties of head of the aeronautical division to another non-aviator, Major Edgar Russell, senior instructor and assistant commandant of the Signal School. In February 1917 the aeronautical division was one of three divisions in the office of the Chief Signal Officer OCSO comprising the aviation section, the others being the Administrative Division and Engineering Division. On October 1, 1917, during World War I, the aeronautical division was renamed the Air Division and was abolished altogether by the War Department on April 24, 1918. Between August 1, 1908, and June 30, 1914, the Signal Corps spent $430,000 on aeronautics, funding the purchase of 30 aircraft and the building of a 31st SC number 23 from spare parts. By 1914, only nine of the surviving 23 remained in service, and two of those that were retired never flew operationally. Topic. Aircraft of the Aeronautical Division Sources, Hennessy, The United States Army Air Arm, April 1861 – April 1917, Chapters 2–6, pp. 28–102, Warnock, From Infant Technology to Obsolescence, The Wright Brothers Airplane in the U.S. Army Signal Corps, 1905–1915. Topic. Heads of the Aeronautical Division The executive head of the Aeronautical Division had no official title between 1907 and 1914 but was usually referred to as the Officer in Charge OIC. The history of assignments of heads of the division in official orders is murky and confused between 1908 and 1916. The four recognized by the USAF as the OICs of the division during this period, and thus as head of its progenitor arm, are denoted by a bullet point. All others are on lists in official studies published by the Office of Air Force History or its successor AFHRA. After July 18, 1914, the division was a part of an aviation section authorized by statute, with a chief of division who as head of the headquarters component also exercised control of the section. August 1, 1907, to July 18, 1914. Captain Charles DeForest Chandler, August 1, 1907 to May 13, 1908. First Lieutenant Frank P. Long, May 14, 1908 to December 1909. Asterisk. Unknown, December 1909 to June 30, 1910. Capt. Arthur S. Cowan, July 1, 1910 to June 19, 1911. Capt. 
Charles de Forest Chandler, June 20, 1911 to April 1, 1913. Asterisk asterisk second Lieutenant Henry H. Arnold, September 18, 1912 to December 14, 1912. Maj. Edgar Russell, December 15, 1912 to September 9, 1913. Lieutenant. Call Samuel Reber, September 10, 1913 to July 17, 1914, Chief of Division, July 18, 1914 to May 5, 1916, Acting Chief of Division. Capt. George S. Gibbs, March 17, 1916 to April 2, 1916. Major Billy Mitchell, April 3, 1916 to May 20, 1916, Chiefs of Division and Aviation Section Head, 1916 to 1918. Lieutenant Call George O. Squire, May 20, 1916 to February 18, 1917. Lieutenant Call John B. Bennett, February 19, 1917 to July 29, 1917. Maj. Benjamin D. Fulwa, July 30, 1917 to November 5, 1917. Brig. General Alexander L. Dade, November 5, 1917 to February 14, 1918. Call. Lawrence Brown, February 28, 1918 to April 24, 1918. Asterisk the Air Force does not acknowledge LOM as OIC of the Aeronautical Division between 1908 and 1910. However, Chandler's biography and Hennessy's history, page 14, indicate that from May 1908 to July 1910 Chandler was commander of the Signal Corps Balloon Station at Fort Omaha, Nebraska. Also, Lom was mandatorily returned to the cavalry in late 1909, and no replacement is given, although if one was assigned, it was likely Fulwa. Asterisk Asterisk Chandler was also chief of the aviation school and commander of the 1st Provisional Aero Squadron when those organizations were active. He was relieved of duty on April 1, 1913, and transferred to the Philippines. Capt. Cowan replaced him in command of the 1st Aero Squadron and as acting OIC of the Aeronautical Division. Topic. Military aviation pioneers with the Aeronautical Division 1st Lieutenant Henry H. Arnold, 29th Infantry, 2nd Rated Military Aviator, July 5, 1912. Capt. Paul W. Beck, Signal Corps, 1st Nominal Head of an Operational Aviation Unit in 1911-12, 1st Advocate of a Separate Air Service. 2d lieutenant lewis h brereton coast artillery corps only member to retire 1948 as part of usaf corporal vernon l berg signal corps first fai certified enlisted pilot june 14 1912 capt charles deff chandler signal corps balloonist twice head of the aeronautical division and third rated pilot july 5 1912 first lieutenant benjamin d fulwa signal corps third solo pilot first army instructor pilot 2 dlt Leighton w hazelhurst 17th infantry second student pilot fatality june 11 1912 2d lieutenant frederick e humphreys corps of engineers first to solo in a military aircraft october 26 1909 2d lieutenant george e m kelly 30th infantry first student and pilot fatality may 10 1911 first lieutenant frank p Lom, 6th cavalry second solo pilot first licensed military pilot and first army aviator overseas 2d lieutenant moss l love signal corps first pilot trained overseas killed september 4 1913 first lieutenant thomas Dew. 
Milling, 15th Cavalry, 1st Rated Military Aviator, July 5, 1912. 2D Lieutenant C. Perry Rich, Philippine Scouts, 1st Overseas Fatality, November 14, 1913. 2D Lieutenant Louis C. Rockwell, 10th Infantry, 1st Licensed Pilot Fatality, September 18, 1912. Corp. Frank S. Scott, Signal Corps, 1st Enlisted and 2nd Passenger Fatality, September 18, 1912. First Lieutenant Thomas E. Selfridge, Jr. First Field Artillery, First Army Officer to Learn to Fly, First Airplane Fatality, September 17, 1908. Topic. See also. Aviation Section, U.S. Signal Corps. Topic. Lineage of the United States Air Force Aeronautical Division, Signal Corps August 1, 1907 to July 18, 1914 Aviation Section, Signal Corps July 18, 1914 to May 20, 1918 Division of Military Aeronautics May 20, 1918 to May 24, 1918 Air Service, United States Army May 24, 1918 to July 2, 1926 United States Army Air Corps July 2, 1926 to June 20, 1941 United States Army Air Forces June 20, 1941 to September 18, 1947 United States Air Force September 18, 1947 present Topic Notes Topic Footnotes Equals 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 citations <laughs>